Hello dear students. In the last lecture, we saw the definition of a subgroup and let me uh, quickly recall what we mean by a subgroup. If I have a group G, so there is some binary operation star on G and if H is a subset of G and if it so happens that H also becomes a group under the same operation as in G. It's very important that H, ha H has to have the same algebraic structure as G. So H should also be a group under the same operation as in G. If that happens, it's like having a mini group sitting inside a bigger group and the smaller one is called a subgroup of the bigger group. And I also gave you all one example of a subgroup in the last lecture and one example of something which is not a subgroup. So let us look at some more examples to begin with. So here the question is uh, a particular group is given to us. Determine which of the following subsets of complex numbers are subgroups under addition, usual addition of the group C of complex numbers. So our parent group is set of complex numbers with respect to addition of complex numbers. And the question is, which of these are examples of subgroups? Well, if you already know that something is a standard subgroup, remember the operation is addition. So you have to check which of these sets with respect to the induced operation of addition on those sets becomes a group on its own. So look at set of real numbers. Set of real numbers for sure is a group with respect to addition and set of real numbers lies inside this. So this one is definitely a subgroup of C. What about the next one? Q plus is set of positive rational numbers. Pause your video and think before I give away the answer to you. So if we look at the set of rational, positive rational numbers, then with respect to addition, this is not a group. Because 0, which is the identity for addition, is not going to belong to this set. So because identity for addition is not there in this set, this set is not a subgroup of C with respect to addition. Okay, let's look at the next one, 7z. Remember in the last chapter, we proved that for any n, nz, for any natural number n, nz with respect to addition is a group. So, in particular, when I take n equal to 7, 7z is also going to be a group with respect to addition and therefore it will be and it is a subset of C. So, it will be a subgroup of C. So, this one is also a subgroup. Next, look at IR. IR is the set of all purely imaginary numbers and uh, it is it's also including 0. So basically this set will contain elements like yi where y is a real number. So it contains all such kinds of complex numbers. It's definitely a subset of C. I leave it to you all to show that this will become a group with respect to addition. And therefore this too will be a subgroup. On exactly the same lines, you can prove that E, the set of all rational multiples of the irrational number pi. This will also be a subgroup. However, look at the last example. Once again, remember the identity for addition. The identity for addition is 0 and there is no way 0 can belong to this set. Because this set contains all integral powers of pi. And pi raised to something is never going to become 0. So because this set does not contain 0, it will never become a group with respect to addition. And therefore, this set is not a subgroup of 
the given group. Now, what you can do is, you can either copy down this example or you can come back to this example. Why I'm saying that is because uh, in the very next lecture, we'll start in this lecture, but in the very next lecture, I will give you a necessary and sufficient condition for a subset to become a subgroup. And once you apply that necessary and sufficient condition, it becomes very easy to check whether something is a subgroup or no. So we can revisit this example at that time and you will see how much easier it becomes to check whether it is a subgroup. So as of the moment, remember what I need to do. If G is a group, with respect to some operation star, H happens to be a subset of G and if this subset also becomes a group under the same operation that is there in G, then H is called a subgroup of G. So, if I have to go by the definition of a subgroup. In order to prove that something is a subgroup, I must firstly ensure that it's a subset of the given group, which in most cases may not be difficult to check. But one has to keep an eye on this. It has to be a subset. And we will have to prove that with respect to the same operation as in G, H will become a group. Which means I will have to prove that for this operation in H all four properties are satisfied. First property is that star should be a binary operation on H or H should be closed under star or closure property should be satisfied in H with respect to star. Secondly, associative property should be satisfied in H with respect to this operation. There should be identity in H with respect to this operation and for every element in H, the inverse also must exist inside H. So I have to do a lot of work in order to prove that H becomes a subgroup and I'm not really prepared to do this much effort to show that something becomes a subgroup. So we need to see if we can somehow simplify matters for us. So before I go on to the necessary and sufficient condition, there is something that you ought to know, namely about There are certain properties which are called as inherited properties. In the second year class, when you study linear algebra and uh, you've seen the definition of vector space and subspaces, uh, we have done something similar for subspaces there. For subspaces also, out of the 10 axioms, quite a few are inherited properties. So, uh, let's talk about those once again over here. So let me assume that G is a set and star is a binary operation on G. I'm not even saying that G is a group. So suppose G is a non-empty set, star is a binary operation on G and suppose this binary operation is associative on G. So I know two things. I know star is a binary operation on G and star is associative on G. So suppose star is a binary operation on G and star is associative. Remember what will happen, what we mean by associative property. It will mean that A star bracket B star C is bracket A star B star C and this will be true for all elements A, B, C in G. So, uh, star is associative on G. Therefore, this equation will be satisfied for all elements of G. Now, suppose H is just a subset of G. I am not saying anything more. Suppose H is a subset of G. Then, we will show that star is also associative on H. 
So all I know is that H is some subset of G. I have no more information about H. H is merely a subset of G. And by using just this fact, I'm going to prove that this operation will also be associative on H. It's not difficult if you give it a thought. If you wish to give it a thought, pause your video, think about it and then get back to the video why this operation should be associative on every single subset of G. So the best way to prove it will be use contradiction. Suppose this operation is not associative on H. Now if this operation was not associative in H, remember in H, I will find, I'll be able to find three specific elements X, Y, Z for which X star Y star Z is not the same as X star Y star Z. So if I assume that star is not associative on H, then in H I will be able to find three specific elements for which this equation is not satisfied, right? But notice that these three elements also belong to G. And if these three elements belong to G, then in G, I will have found three elements for which this is not satisfied. But that is a violation of this. Remember when I said star is associative on G, it means this equation has to be satisfied for all elements in G. These are also elements in G. So I get a contradiction. And therefore, my assumption that star is not associative on H is wrong. And therefore, if the operation is associative on the bigger set, automatically it will be associative on every subset of G. It is like a dominant genes of parents. They are passed on to every single child. So inherited properties are such properties which are very dominant in nature. So if the parent group has that property, automatically every subset also will get it. So this frees us from proving the inherited properties. So if I know that associated property is inherited for a subset, I don't need to prove that property separately henceforth. Which other properties do you think are inherited? Give it a thought. Is closure property inherited? Not really. Check. Subtraction is a binary operation on the set of integers. However, you look at this subset of Z. This is not a binary operation on the set of natural numbers. So, closure property is not an inherited property. Not an inherited property means some subsets will have it, some subsets will not have the property. It's not like associative property. If the bigger set has the associative property, automatically every subset of it will get the associative property. But closure property is not inherited. Some subsets may have the closure property. Some subsets may not have the closure property. What about identity? Same story. Look at set of integers with respect to addition. This set does have identity. Set of natural numbers is a subset of integers. But identity is not here. So existence of identity is also not an inherited property. Same goes for the inverse, but you can prove and I would like you all to do this as an exercise that even commutative property is inherited. So out of the five properties that we have studied, closure, associative, identity, inverse and commutative properties, only two properties are inherited, the associative property and the commutative property. Remaining properties have to be verified separately. We will see how this comes to use in the next lecture where we will look at a necessary and sufficient condition or we will look at two necessary and sufficient conditions for a subset to become a subgroup. But that will be all for now. Thank you.